excuse me if I cough a bit, all that lovely singing. <laughs> God is good. Um, the um, reading is taken from Luke 9, verses 28 to 36, and it's on page 1040 of our church Bibles. <clears throat> it's entitled The Transfiguration. After about, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came down from the cloud saying, This is my son who I'm, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. Can we just all stretch our hands and pray yeah. for Andrew so that the Lord will speak to us personally as he speaks. Father, we thank you for your servant. And Lord, we ask that you speak to us through him. <laughs> Touch each and every heart as we listen today. And let there be a word for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Good morning. Nice to, uh, nice to see you. My name's uh, Andrew. Well, Andrew, Andy, actually. Everyone calls me Andy. The only person who used to call me Andrew was my mum when she was cross with me. You know, Andrew? Yeah, and usually it was, a, you know, it was a sort of, Andrew Neil Gardner, what are you doing? Is that, you know, usual mums, you, you'll get that. And this is my wife, Joanna, and it's lovely to be here. I'm a um, curate down at St. Mary's. I'm in my final year. Um, so I've been in Luton for two and a half years, and it's just wonderful to be with you today. Um, some of you I know, you came on our men's walking weekend. Um, some of you I don't know, but I'm sure we'll get to know you later. Um, before ordination, I've been ordained two and a half years, um, but before that, I was in business for many, many years, and I worked in telecoms and IT, and I used to uh, sort of um, fly around various places around the world. And the question I have for you is, have you ever had an experience or an encounter that was so profound that it completely changed the way that you saw the world? Have you ever had one of those days when your world was turned upside down. It might have been um, a great experience, like a baby arriving or something like that, or it might have been something dramatic that caused a real reevaluation in the way that we, um, we live our lives and the way that we, we see the world. And, um, and one of those days, you know, sometimes can be characterized by when you ask the question, where were you when something happened, you know, the royal wedding or whatever. My question is this, where were you on September the 11th, 2011? Yeah, we all know where we were. I know where I was. And um, before, when there was, um, I'd like to tell you a story about something relates, relating to that. Because um, I was, um, when I worked in IT and telecoms, and I used to fly around, one of the places I used to go an awful lot was America. And at the time, funnily enough, that all of the 9-11 happened, I was actually looking after for British Telecom our relationship with the, all, the, all the airlines and airports and all what have you. So a number of my customers were directly affected. But I don't want to tell you a story about me. I want to talk to you a story about a guy called JT, John Thompson. And John was a sales guy who worked for BT North America. He was a New Yorker. If ever you want the description, like almost like the, um, you know, your epitome of an American sales guy, it was JT. He was New York. He was cool. He was straight talking. And we were sort of working with this, you know, he supported the Yankees and all this sort of stuff. And he would do this stuff. He was a hard-living, hard-drinking, all-American sales guy. Probably around about 30, 32, that was sort of thing. 
Now, we were doing quite a bit of work at the time with one of the US airlines, so I was quite working with JT. And um, I remember he told me this story, and it was a year after 9-11 happened, he told me this story. Now, in order for, me to, for you to understand this, those of us who sort of work in a customer-facing role, particularly in IT, we all understand that the bane of our lives were the legal department, the lawyers. I guess it's the same for everybody. But the reason, you know, particularly in BT, that it was difficult was because the lawyers always seemed to be the people who were, who were holding up business. And on this one particular day, JT had an appointment, a very important appointment, to sign a contract at 9 o'clock this particular morning with a client. And the night before, the lawyer called him and said, we have a problem, we can't sign this. I don't know, a, an apostrophe was in the wrong place or something, or they used the wrong font or whatever it was. Anyway, these, these absolutely particular lawyers were causing a real problem. So JT had to phone up and, and delay the, the signing of that contract until the afternoon. Now, that contract was never signed because the day in question was September the 11th, 2000, 2001, and the place it was going to be signed was in the South Tower of the World Trade Center. You know, if JT had been there, if our lawyer hadn't been so particular about the comma or whatever it is or the full stop, JT would well have been in the South Tower above the level where the plane hit, which meant he certainly would, have, uh, you know, would not be here today to tell the story. And I remember being with him actually in Houston on September the 11th, 2002, and noting that this hard-drinking, all-American New York salesman went to church that afternoon to the memorial service you know, mourning those who'd been lost. And I remember him saying, I never thought I'd be giving thanks for lawyers, but he did. JT had what psychologists call a paradigm shift. And I think the text that we have today describes a paradigm shift, a lens change, a scene change for our disciples. It was something, they'd been following this guy called Jesus for three years, it took a couple of years. It happened really just as he was on his way to Jerusalem. And and, um, you know, they thought that this guy was a rabbi, a healer, whatever he was, obviously a very special guy, probably a key prophet. But this encounter showed that this man called Jesus, who they've been following, was a lot more than that. There was more to Jesus than they had ever imagined. Now, one of the TV shows I always used to like to watch from time was the one Secret Millionaire. Has anybody ever seen that? Yeah, see your hand if you've seen it. Yeah, that's great. And for those who don't know, it's... Um, it's something that the TV's put on. And, and, what, and, and the one that like me, and normally what they do is they get some big shots, some, some rich person, and they sort of disguise him or her, and they put them into a, an ordinary situation, and they you know, mix with normal people. And then right at the end, it's actually revealed that, no, they're not this sort of, you know, the checkout person at Asda or somebody who stacks you know, the shelves at Amazon or whatever like this, or an unemployed person, that they are really a secret millionaire. And I remember one I saw, which I really liked, was, um, you know, I come from the north of England, and uh, it was about um, this guy who was a very wealthy property man, many, many millions, and they put him down as, a, as, a, as a basically an unemployed guy in Salford, and they took him back to his old boxing club, the boys' club, and you know, he was you know, just portrayed as someone helping out. And eventually, at the end, it was, ta-da, I'm really not that person, I'm a very wealthy man, and he has an awful lot of money. And um, imagine, you know, this is what they do. I keep praying that'll happen to me. Sadly, it hasn't. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but if anybody has a lot of money you'd like to give me, just feel, I'll give you my phone number later. You know, they had no idea that this guy who was, who'd been amongst them, who'd lived amongst them for a number of weeks, was actually incredibly special. He's turned out to be very, very different than they imagined that he would be. Now, I imagine that this is how the disciples felt on the Mount of Transfiguration. This realization... This rabbi, this man who'd been with them, this prophet who'd been with them for a couple of years, was much, much greater than ever they had seen or imagined. So I'd love us to think about a few things we can get out of this text, and then let's figure out what we can do and what we can take from that today you know, in, uh, you know, in this time in 2019 here for Christ Church. So about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with them, and they went up to the mountain to pray. Like I say, this, this uh, event happened as Jesus was coming to the end of his ministry in Galilee. Really, you know, just as he was turning you know, to, to head towards Jerusalem for the crucifixion, for the cross. And it was always his custom to go out to pray in a lonely place. And this time he took Peter, James, and John with him. But obviously this prayer meeting was unlike any other they'd ever been to. This theophany, this meeting of heaven and earth. Because it says this, he says, as he was praying, 
The appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. And, you know, this was enormous. In those days, wandering rabbis were quite common. And Jesus, they saw, was different. He taught with authority. He connected with poor people. He didn't limit himself to the intelligentsia and the social elite. He healed the sick. He did miracles. It was the sort of thing, like I say, for a first century you know, Jewish person, they thought, you know, any self-respecting prophet would do. And I think even though that Peter had previously sort of discerned that he was the Messiah, what they saw on that mountaintop would have been a bit like the secret millionaire for them. It would have been a case of, oh, my word, you are way, way more than I ever thought. It was an event just like the Old Testament story, just like when, when Solomon dedicated the temple, and it says the glory of the Lord came down to the point that nobody could carry on their meeting anymore. And in the middle of this, there was, in this God sign of his tangible presence, this cloud, the Hebrew word is the kabod, that weight of God, you know, the Shekinah glory coming down upon them. There were Moses and Elijah, Moses, you know, who Christ had spoken of prophetically, and Elijah, who often in, the, in those days was seen by the theologians of the time as the person who would come, for, almost like prefiguring the coming of the Messiah. All of this would have been like that huge heavenly lamppost, that flashing sign, that neon sign, saying, listen up, look at this guy, this Jesus, he is the Messiah. He is the chosen one. He is the one who is going to come. And Peter's reaction, what was it? Was it to worship? Was it to fall on his face? No, it says, Peter and his companions were very sleepy. And they became fully awake when they saw this. I bet they did. And then Peter said, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up a tent. Three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And I love the way that the Bible obviously sometimes understates it. It said, he didn't know what he was saying. You bet. I mean, what an understatement that was. He hadn't got a clue, had he? It's like, you know, it would be like, you know, sort of like, you know, like, like the queen arriving through the door and saying, oh, would you like a cup of tea or something like that? You know, there's a reason that Peter was a fisherman and not a theologian, by the way, and that really says it. Like me, and I think like many of us at the time, so often we miss the point. As often we see the glory of God, but we miss the point. And it says in verse 34, it picks up and it says, While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud and said, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. The final act of this was God repeating in front of everybody those words he spoke to Jesus at his baptism. This is my beloved son with whom I well pleased. And uh, Peter, bless him, didn't fully understand what was going on. And I'm so encouraged by Peter so many times. Because then they're like you. Just because you get one of these doesn't mean you always understand what's going on, by the way. I mean, it's, uh, that's what I've found the last two or three years. You know, we're as clueless as everybody, probably. But the great thing about you know, living and working and walking with God is that so often, through his grace anyway, he does what he wants to do, even when we don't get it, just like Peter and just like many of us. So what can we take away from this profound uh, section of Luke's gospel? And there's so many things, but you know, I'd like to really um, you know, focus on just a couple. And the, and the one really that I think I'd like, to, like us to take away is this, is that is how easy it is, like Peter, like James and John, like with a secret millionaire or whatever, how easy it is for our view, our perception, our perspective of Jesus to get too small. And our need so often to rediscover the greatness and the power of our Lord. Like our friend, the secret millionaire, we need to see the world in a way that turns out to be much, much bigger than what we maybe perceive. You know, and I think it's uh, from experience this is especially true. You know, if we're in a situation where I, th I think like, you know, like here, where you know, it's, it's been a tough time, you're in an interregnum, things have been challenging, things have been hard, things have been painful. There's grief, there's upset, there's hurt, and often we hold that with us. And when we do, it's difficult sometimes for us to remember just how big God is and the fact that some of the words are he's the deliverer, the redeemer, the person who takes all of that bad stuff 
transforms it and turns it into something glorious and good. Sometimes, you know, like the transfiguration, we bring our things onto the mountain in prayer and we don't realize that God's intent is to take that and to shine with his glory despite our humanity. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I've become aware of, you know, even over the last couple of years, you know, just the inordained ministry is, is actually how easy it is for us to get caught up in, I would say, the trappings of faith. You know, that they're necessary, they're important things. It's running a church, it's doing all the things, it's, you know, it's, it's keeping the building right, it's getting the money right, it's making sure we have services week by week, it's thinking about all these things. And all those things are great and are good to do. However, it's often we lose, lose sight of that central point, that this is all about the fact that God is real, that he sent his son to save us on the cross, to die and rise again, and he's given us his Holy Spirit to live with us until Christ comes again. I remember um, quite a few years ago, some of my favorite stories, Joanna's heard this many, many millions of times. Um, I used to be, met, we, before here, I was, a, uh, was a term sole survivor in Watford, and we, I was part of a team planted out from uh, St. Andrew's Chorley Wood at the time. And um, we went on this ministry trip in the very, very, very early days over to Russia. And it was the time um, before Vladimir Putin came, when old um, Boris Yeltsin, had, well, even, even before he was the time when those of you who are old enough remember when, when um, Gorbachev got overthrown for a while and there was this big thing, what was going to happen? It was like right in the middle of that. It was just that period. It was in November just after this. And we got invited to go out to, uh, what I used to be in Watford, in Watford's Twitter. Yeah, don't, don't hit, no, I don't support Watford, just a few Luton Town fans. <laughs> just sort of better say that. I don't support Watford, you know. Um, and, um, you know, I just live there. I don't support them. There we go. That's good. I always have to say that in Luton, I know. Um, and... Um, and uh, we got invited out to Watford's Twin Town, which is a place called Novgorod, which is about a three-hour drive south of St. Petersburg. And we went there to this little town and um, this, this church, and it, was, it met in a woodshed. And there were probably around about 15 or 20 faithful souls. But that week, we saw this sort of outpouring of the Holy Spirit, like I'd never, ever, ever seen before. And um, it, was, it was funny, because I remember going into it. You know, it was, it was a difficult time at work and all this stuff, and I remember I had a bad cold. And I just felt so ill-equipped at that point. And I went in there, and we got on the plane. And I remember praying and saying, well, Lord, I just don't feel like I've got anything to give. Maybe you're taking me there so that you can minister to me. But we landed, and we saw God's glory fall. Things like, I remember, in the first meeting, uh, we, were, um, we were sat around, and there were just a bunch of people. They didn't know us. And the guy who was speaking, we were about to do a ministry time. And everybody stood up, and he said, um, you know, I'm, um, in a few moments, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come. And, and he's about to explain what might happen. And this lady fell down under the power of the Holy Spirit. She fell over. And, and this lady apparently wasn't a Christian. The, the, the translator hadn't even translated into Russian what he'd said. And that sort of set the scene for the week. And we saw people healed of all sorts of stuff. I mean, it was, it was amazing. And uh, the one that stood, stood out to me was a particular lady I prayed for. And in order to do this, I need to explain something about Russian and about Russian grannies. They have these, you know, R Russian society is run by babushkas, okay? These are the grannies. They often, they're, they're widows and they dress in black. Most of them are probably about this tall, okay? And probably slightly wider than about three of me, you know? They, they would comprise the England scrum front row on their own. They, these are like, sort of like, you know, sort of, you know, sort of a... Uh, Kick them dead, kick them dead grannies. And I remember this one particular time when we were praying, this, um, um, this, the biggest of these babushkas sort of comes up to me. And Svetlana, who was the interpreter, was there. And she said, you know, this lady goes off in Russian, blah, 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 you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. whatever. Sounds like a meerkat to me, but there we go. And, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. And she says, yes, yeah, she says. She said she had a stroke two years ago and her arm is paralyzed. Forgive my appalling Russian accent. She said, um, she said uh, but you pray for her and God will heal her. And I thought, oh, will he? I thought, oh my word, you know what I mean? And, and then I started sort of having this sort of mind game, which is to say, okay, I'm going to pray for her. What's going to happen? If she's not healed, she might hit me with a good arm and someone will need to pray for me. Or if I pray for her and she falls over, you know, I will have to catch her and then someone will have to pray for my back or something like that because she, she was ra rather rotund, should we say. You know, or whatever. Anyway, so with little faith, I, I started saying, okay, Holy Spirit, come, please heal her. 
please, Lord, you better not let me down because I'm in real trouble with you. <laughs> you know, one of those real faithful prayers. Anyway, and, and then she started to shake, and I thought, oh, no, she is going to fall over. I'm going to have to catch her. Fortunately, she didn't. And then she starts going like this. She starts going, oh, hallelujah, 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 blah, 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 in Russian, whatever it was, meerkat language, and off she walks. And then Svetlana was there saying, yes, hallelujah, she's healed, and she walks off too. <laughs> now, at, at this point, I thought, somebody's having a laugh here. Somebody, like, somebody's obviously put her up to this, whatever. But then she, this lady gave her... Um, her testimony the next night, and she said, yes, you know, for two years, I've been unable to do my hair. Look, I've put my hair in a bun, and look, I've been able to do it myself. Then she said, and also, I suffer from glaucoma, but the pain in my eyes has gone. And she said, God has healed me. And, you know, the point about that, and so, so then, there's a very significant move of God went on at the time. Svetlana, by the way, the, the interpreter, wasn't a Christian. She was a local English teacher who just, hearing there were English people in town, had come to get some practice. And I remember at the end of the week, we said to her, um, you know, well, you've seen, would you like to know this Jesus for yourself? And she said yes, and we had this joy of leading her to the Lord because she saw, you know, what had happened. And then she said, you know, could you pray for us because, um, you know, we've been trying to have children for about, I think it was seven or eight years. The doctor said we can't. And so Joanna and another lady prayed, and like nine months later, she had a little Elizabeth, Elizabeth named after the queen, apparently, the point is this, it, it was a significant move of God, and it was one of those times where, you know, and I've, seen, you know, I've been fortunate to see some great moves of God over the years, but, but um, you know, and to, be, to, to, to participate in that, but I think that was one where it was like, it was intense, you know, it was like the ice wine, you know, it was like that concentrated glory of God there for a week in a very, very poor area. It was one of those times, I think, like on the Mount of Transfiguration for Peter, James, and John, it opened my eyes, because I remember, you know, coming back saying, wow. This God is big, not just in theory, not just in theology, but in practice too. We'd seen a glimpse of it before, but then we'd absolutely seen it before our eyes. And, you know, the punchline of all this, I would say, is the reason we come isn't to church. It's not because, you know, of a wonderful, comfortable building. It's not because we're, you know, even being part of a lovely, accepting community that I think you are. It's not even because you have a, you know, a very handsome preacher, although, of course, I am. The reason <laughs> we come, firstly and lastly, and all the bits in between, is because Jesus is real, Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is with us today. And I think the, you know, the, you know, the, the key word, I, I would say, or the key punchline, I think, of the story of the transfiguration is this. Never let our vision of Jesus ever get too small. He's the one who is able. He is the one who is able to save us whenever, whatever we do. I just find a little story to finish off. Uh, my time you know, at Soul Survivor, I mean, Soul Survivor is now a very big church. I think nearly 1,000 people in it. But when we started it about 24, 25 years ago, 1993, what's that? 16 years ago, my word. Time flies. Um, we, um, um, you know, we, we were just a bunch of, you know, sort of like we had a bunch of school kids, a couple of students. I think we were about 27, 28. You know, we had a little boy, big mortgage, no money. And I remember this one time, we used to do the, um, you know, the celebrations at the local school. We used to hire a PA, and uh, the person who was, um, who was charged with taking it back that one particular night, he hadn't, he hadn't offloaded it into his garage. He left it in his car outside his parents' house. And that night, somebody stole the PA that we had hired. And because it was in the car, it was uninsured. And we were, we were owed 4,000, we, we owed the company 4,000 pounds for this PA. 4,000 pounds, we didn't have 40 pounds, you know, let alone 4,000. So it was completely and utterly beyond our reach. And um, you know, Mike, Mike Kilovarchi, he's a senior pastor, sort of tells a story that they were in the offices you know, at St. Andrews where in the early days we used to meet. And, uh, and he said he would like to say that he was praying in faith. He said, in reality, he was flapping around like a wet hen, saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? He said, I'll sell my car. What are we going to do? And, uh, and apparently somebody there said, Mike, your car isn't worth four pounds, let alone, <laughs> you know, let alone 4,000. He said, he said, you'd have to pay someone to take that wreck away. And he said that whilst he, he said he was flapping around, saying that, apparently the phone rang downstairs in the office and somebody put it through and said, Mike, is somebody on the phone for you? And it was, um, it was a businessman uh, who went to St. Andrew's Chorley Wood and uh, who'd only been a Christian for a few years, and he said, uh, for, for, for a few months, who knew nothing of what had gone on, by the way. And he said, um, yeah, he said, I was driving between a couple, couple of my businesses. And he said, uh, and as I was praying, God spoke to me. 
And he told me, he said, I need to give you some money. So he said, just to let you know, I'm sending you a check for 4,000 pounds. And then he said, but then, but then he said, it came with a message, and it was this. God says, don't let money be the thing that's, never let money be the thing that stops the work you're doing with young people in Watford. You see, the God that we serve is bigger than we could ever imagine, and he's here with us. And um, I think in this time of interregnum, when it's all a strain, when, you know, it's always, it's a difficult, you process stuff, you're trying to run stuff, and you're thinking about what might happen, there might be a bit of anxiety, just remember, God is bigger than anything we can imagine. Amen.